Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Most people who learn a foreign language learn it so that they can one day have real life conversations with native speakers. When you start out learning and crack open your first textbook or listen to your first podcast, having a real conversation can feel like a fantasy. When everything about a language feels new, it can be overwhelming. But this couldn't be further from the truth. While it does take a significant amount of time and effort to become fluent, having a conversation might not be as far off as you think. In this video, we'll look at three ways you can boost your conversational skills and start talking to native speakers. Number one, find native speakers and practice with them. It's unlikely you live near a big group of native speakers to practice with. If you happen to be in a major or international city, your chances may be better. Check and see if your city has a general language exchange. Chances are there could be a native speaker there who is also trying to learn another language. Practicing in person with a native speaker is probably the most interesting option for honing your speaking skills. But if you can't find anyone where you live, the next best option is to look online. Luckily for language learners, the past 10 years or so have seen an explosion in online language exchange sites. On these websites, you can search for someone who is a native speaker of your target language and is also learning your native language. The idea behind a language exchange is that you communicate with them via video or text chat, and half of the time, they help you practice your target language, and for the other half, you help them practice theirs. Practicing via an online language exchange is a highly effective way to practice your conversational skills. Number two, work on pronunciation. Pronunciation is often an overlooked skill when it comes to learning a foreign language. Most people think of a good foreign accent as a luxury rather than a necessity. But what most people don't talk about is how having a good accent boosts your listening and comprehension skills. If you can hear a sound from a foreign language and know how to make it yourself, then you're more likely to understand native speakers when they talk at normal speed, and you're also more likely to remember any new words or phrases you come across. Having a good accent means that the language no longer sounds foreign. Instead, it sounds familiar, maybe even natural. So how do you go about perfecting your accent? The best way is to break down the language into its individual sounds. Make note of any sounds that are the same or similar to your native language and of those that are different. Of the sounds that are different, spend your time practicing the ones that you find the hardest to say correctly. After you're comfortable with the individual sounds, you can start linking together words and phrases. This is where accent practice starts to get really fun and interesting. Get your hands on some native speaker audio from a TV show, song, or podcast. Play the audio back and listen closely a few times. Take note of how words blend together in speech. Then, do your best to imitate what you hear, trying to match the speaker's emphasis and intonation. Our language learning program's playback feature is perfect for this. Record yourself and compare it to the original recording. Rinse and repeat until you're comfortable with the audio selection, and then move on to something more difficult. This is how you can break through the accent barrier and really start to make the language your own. Number three, learn phrases, not just individual words. Learning grammar and individual words is great, but it's not the only approach you should take if you want to speak fluently. In addition to your regular grammar and vocabulary, try learning whole phrases, even if you aren't totally sure how they work grammatically. Learn phrases that are specific to your needs. It's a good idea to learn phrases that are grouped around a certain setting or subject, such as simple greetings or introductions, questions for getting to know someone, or traveling comfortably. You can even learn filler phrases, which you can use so that you have something to say when, well, you don't know what to say. Learning phrases like this will help you become conversational faster. You may not understand what you're saying literally, but as long as you know the general meaning behind the phrase and know when to use it, you'll be able to talk like a native. Eventually, your knowledge of grammar and vocabulary should catch up with the phrases you know. Learning a new language should feel like an adventure. There will be plateaus and periods in your learning where it feels like you're hitting a wall, but being able to speak with native speakers and have real conversations will help you combat language fatigue. After all, talking to someone face-to-face -face in a foreign language is one of the main reasons we start learning in the first place. And for even more ways to gain conversation skills, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel.
We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Whenever I'm ready. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about 10 words for connecting thoughts. These are going to be 10 words that you can use to transition between ideas. Very useful in both speech and in writing. Let's go. Also, also, also is a word that you can use to add information. I went to the store this morning. Also, I went and got coffee. That's true. However, however, however is used to contrast or to contrast, depending on your pronunciation, to differentiate, to show a difference between two pieces of information. A good pattern would be A, however, B. So, for example, I love tonkotsu ramen. However, it is very high in calories, so I don't eat it often. Also true. On the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand is, I feel, used more commonly in speech than it is in writing. Um, again, it's used to present like two sides to a story or two sides to some information. So, for example, mm, I'm thinking about visiting Taiwan sometime this year, but on the other hand, I'm also thinking about visiting Thailand. Still. So, it might be common to use still with a word like but or a word like even though. So, you're saying even though there's some other factor, like, um, like I'm really, really tired this week, or even though I have a lot of homework to do, I still want to go out with my friends, or I still want to um, see a movie this weekend. So, there's this other, there's this thing that's maybe makes this other action difficult to do, or tough to do, or whatever. Um, but even though there's this, you still have this over here. So maybe the two are kind of used as a pair. So I still want to go out later, even though I'm tired. Then. Then. Yes, a very useful word. We use then when telling stories a lot. Um, so for example, if I could tell a story about my morning today. When I got up, I brushed my teeth, and then <laughs> I cooked breakfast, then I did a little bit of work, then I took a shower, then I did some cooking, blah, blah, blah. You'll often hear and then as well. And then I, and then we, and then you, and so on. So then is, is really, really useful for sequence. So a useful word, I think. Besides. Besides. So it's commonly used in a pattern like besides that, meaning other than something else. I went out with my friends this weekend, but besides that, I didn't really do much. So another way to say that sentence is, I went out with my friends this weekend, but other than that, other than that activity, I didn't do very much. Hmm. Okay. Meanwhile, meanwhile, or you might hear the similar expression in the meantime. It means while you're doing action A, at the same time, maybe somewhere else, action B is happening. This is used while telling stories a lot. So for example, I was working at my office all week last week, Meanwhile, my coworkers across town were having a party without me. So these two things are happening at the same time, uh, but maybe separate from one another. Meanwhile. Likewise. Okay, likewise. I don't really use this word personally myself at all. It's often used after an introduction, um, similar to the pleasure is all mine in a formal situation. So maybe somebody says, you know, hey, it was really great to see you last weekend. Thanks very much for coming to my barbecue. You can say, yeah, likewise, it was really good to see you and your family. So likewise means I have the same feeling or I have the same idea. It's kind of a friendly phrase, but personally, I don't really use that to transition between thoughts. Um, I would just use and, I suppose, but no, no. Uh, that's how I would use it. Instead. Instead. So, so instead, it, it's used like instead of. I want to A instead of B can be used to express your plans or what you want to do. I want to have Chinese food instead of Italian food tonight. So you're, you're presenting two alternatives, essentially. So instead of means in place of or as a substitute for. So I 
should have drank a lot of water this morning, but instead I drank a lot of coffee. That's true. Uh, I wanted to um, have dinner with my friends this weekend. Instead, I had dinner at home. In addition, in addition, this is a really good word for more formal situations. I like to use in addition in writing. I don't really use in addition in speaking unless I'm trying to be very formal for some reason, uh, similar to additionally as well. So you make point A and point B, and then when you want to make one more point that's related to point A and point B, you can say, in addition, point C. So you're like building an argument, and in addition can be used to kind of finish that argument off a little bit. Our new marketing plan worked really well last month. We noticed increased sales in product A, in addition, uh, we've gained a lot of new customers, something like that. So just you're, you're quickly presenting a series of ideas that are related to one another. You can use in addition to finish it off. All right, so that's the end of 10 words for connecting thoughts. I hope you get to use a lot of these. Try to mix it up. It's good to use a, a variety of different words. Thanks very much for watching this episode, and we will see you again next time for more fun stuff. Bye! Hmm. Whenever I'm ready. All right, welcome back to Weekly Words. I'm Alicia, and this week, we're gonna talk about commonly mispronounced, mispronounced, wow. This week, we're gonna talk about commonly mispronounced words, words that are often pronounced incorrectly. <laughs> this is funny. I enjoy mispronouncing this first word. The first word is hyperbole. Hyperbole. Um, it's not hyperbole, though it does sound very funny to say that. Uh, hyperbole just means to exaggerate something um, or to make, to blow something up, make it uh, really extreme. My friend uses a lot of hyperbole when she talks about her life stories. I really don't think some of those things happen to her. Hyperbole, not hyperbole. Next, Antarctic, not, ah, oh, I see. Antarctic is the correct pronunciation of this word. Some people say an Antar Antarctic, really? Oh, I guess when you're saying this word quickly, you might leave out that first C in the Antarctic. Uh, so don't say that, don't do that. Say Antarctic, the, the very, very cold region. The Arctic is the north cold region on the planet Earth. The south is the Antarctic. There's sort of like almost a hiccup in the word there, Antarctic. Oh, uh, in a sentence, I'm thinking about taking a cruise to the Antarctic. What do you think I need? A penguin suit, etc. Not etc. Oh yeah, okay. I've heard I hear this ek ek thing a lot. Etc. is just used at the end of a list to uh, imply that you mean other things. Uh, so the list is not um, exclusive to the things that you've listed. Other things can also be included in it. So in a sample sentence, um, types of fruits are apples, oranges, peaches, etc. There are others as well. So don't say etc. That's not correct. Etc. That's good. The next word is jewelry. What? Not mayonnaise? <laughs> the next word is jewelry. Jewelry. I think I'm probably guilty of this mispronunciation. I can't say that word, mispronunciation, uh, where the word kind of gets a little bit smushed together uh, and we say jewelry instead. We miss that, that second E sound in there. It should be jewelry. Uh, in a sample sentence, maybe you would say, I'm shopping for some jewelry for my mother for her birthday. Jewelry, we're too lazy. Prescription, not prescription. Okay, a prescription is something that a doctor gives you. When you're sick and you require medicine, the doctor will write you a prescription. Some people might say, prescription. Wow, okay. I didn't, I didn't even notice, and I was doing it while I was telling you guys not to do it. That's embarrassing. Prescription. A doctor writes you a prescription, not a prescription. Uh, when you go to the doctor's office, the doctor might say, here is your prescription. End. All right. Well, we've learned that I apparently can't pronounce some words the way that they're meant to be pronounced. So please work on your pronunciation. I will work on my pronunciation, too. Thank you for joining us on Weekly Words this week. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. 
Welcome back to Weekly Words. My name is Alicia, and this week we're going to talk about commonly quoted movie lines. Ooh, I hope I know these. I'll be back. A lot of people like to try and do an Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. This comes from the movie Terminator, where Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a robot from the future. And it's really awesome. You can use this with your friends. You can use this in, in common everyday situations where you have to leave someplace, but you want to tell people in a kind of a funny way that you plan on coming back. You can say, I'll be back. Inconceivable. Say this with a lisp. Inconceivable. If you've seen the movie The Princess Bride, inconceivable. So to conceive of something, something you can think about, um, putting that in uh, at the beginning of the word means can't con or not able to conceive of something. You can't even think about it. You can't believe it, in other words. This is one word that means I can't believe it or this is just ridiculous. So you can use this anytime you're just shocked by something. You just can't believe that something is happening. You can say inconceivable. This is a very good one, a recent one from the movie Anchorman. Will Ferrell says this. Uh, he says, I immediately regret this decision. I immediately regret this decision. It's a very long phrase, uh, but it means You've just made a choice and you very quickly, immediately realize this was a bad decision. I should not have done this. You can say, I immediately regret this decision. But with kind of like a flat tone to it, uh, it's a little bit funny. Okay, next is a very famous quote from the movie Forrest Gump. Tom Hanks was in this movie. His character famously says, Mama always said life was like a box of chocolates. The next line is, you never know what you're gonna get. So this refers to picking a piece of chocolate out of a box of chocolates. Uh, maybe you've seen kind of the fancy ones that have a number of different styles of chocolate in them. When you bite into it, oftentimes you don't know what's on the inside. So the character is saying that life is like that too. You might try to do a few different things, uh, but you never know what's going to happen until you actually try to do it. So this is an interesting phrase to use. Maybe if your friend is having trouble in their life in some way, you can maybe try to console them or cheer them up by saying, Mama always said life was like a box of chocolates. The next quote comes from the movie Apollo 13, a very very famous space movie. The quote is, Houston, we have a problem. Houston refers to the control center, NASA's control center, and the astronaut is famously quoted as saying, we have a problem. Anytime you run across a problem uh, at work or with your friends, with your family, whatever, you can say, Houston, we have a problem, meaning you're just trying to alert the other people around you that something is wrong. You need help with something, perhaps. So it's usually not a very serious problem though, I should say that. So don't use it for like a medical emergency. Use it for something, you know, like, oh, I'm out of eggs, Houston, we have a problem, you know, if you're cooking. Something very, very lighthearted is good. And that's the end of some famous movie quotes. So try to use a few of these if you like. Uh, they're kind of fun. And if you use them with the right timing, they can be very, very funny. And people will generally appreciate that you use such uh, interesting references in your conversation. Uh, thanks very much for joining us this week, and we'll see you again next time. Bye. Here's looking at you, kid. <laughs> what does that even mean, though? Your classic goodbye line, kind of. Welcome back to Weekly Words. I'm Alicia, and this week we are going to do words with strange plural forms. This is good practice, I bet. Let's start. Yeah. Antenna. The plural form of antenna is antennae. I think I would say antennae. Antennae. I think I'd probably actually just say antennas. An antenna on an old uh, TV set, for example, would be it would kind of look like this. We'd call it bunny ears, where you had to adjust the bunny ears. You had to adjust, adjust the antennae to make the signal on your TV come in more clearly. Bugs, they have antennae from their heads. The next word is millennium. The plural is millennia. A millennium is a period of a thousand years. A thousand years is a millennium. A series of thousands of years would be called millennia. You might say many millennia have passed since the Earth was formed. Cactus is the next word. A cactus is a plant, a thorny plant. <laughs> These are the arms of the cactus. I couldn't make the trunk of the cactus. Wow, you can put a picture on the screen instead of my amazing cactus. Cactus, the plural of cactus is cacti or cactuses. I think I'm more inclined to say cacti. So when you go to the desert, you might say, keep an eye out for cacti. If you step on one, it could really hurt you. The next one is an interesting one. I, I don't think I've ever used this word in the singular. Like if you have a swimming pool or if you've seen a pond or whatever, it's that green sort of scummy stuff that accumulates on top of it or on the sides of your pool if you haven't cleaned it in a while. Algae, bacteria, and things that like to live in the water. 
there's a singular form and I'm just, I'm looking at it for the first time. I don't know how alga? To use the plural then you would say, I need to clean my pool. There's a lot of algae in it. Yeah. Next is ox. Ox. Uh, the plural of ox is oxen. These animals used to be used for farming. I don't know that they are very much anymore. I don't have much personal experience with farming. Um, but they're, they look like really, really big cows with huge horns. Huge horns, yeah. Okay, next is the end. Uh, plural. Words that have weird plural forms. So please keep them in mind when you are trying to use them in conversation and use the correct form of the plural. Thank you for joining us again this week for Weekly Words. Next time we will see you for more Weekly Words. That was weird. We'll see you again next week for more fun information. Take care. Bye. Oh no. All right, welcome back to Weekly Words. My name is Alicia and this week we are going to talk about commonly used onomatopoeia. This is going to be a fun one. We talked briefly about an onomatopoeia zoom in a previous episode of Weekly Words. We're going to talk some more about some more. Talk some more about some more. We're going to talk about more today. The first word is beep. Oh, beep. Beep is any kind of electronic sound or a car sound. It was also in a popular American cartoon, Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. The Roadrunner would commonly say, meep, meep. Car sound will usually make a beep or a honk sound. For electronics, however, the beep becomes a little bit more robotic. We'll often say like, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> so in a sentence, let's say you have a computer problem. You tell your friend, the computer won't stop beeping at me. What do I do? Next is the sound jingle. Jingle is uh, any kind of light ringing sound. This word gets used a lot uh, in holiday seasons, particularly Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's. Any jingling sound is um, very commonly assigned to bells. Like the song Jingle Bells, for example, is a perfect example of this. Jingle is just the sound that a bell makes. In a sentence, let's see, you might say, she has a small bell attached to her phone, so she jingles everywhere she walks really irritating. <laughs> okay. The next word is thump. A thump is for something to hit heavily. To give an example, the people who live in the apartment above me often thump on the floor. It sounds like maybe they're dropping something heavy or um, they're stepping very heavily. All right. Next is splash. Anything that falls into liquid, lands in liquid, makes a splash. It's that psh sort of sound that comes from water or any other liquid, really. We refer to that as a splash sound. There is also a popular Tom Hanks mermaid movie called Splash. This has nothing to do with that, about him falling in love with a mermaid. I made a big splash when I jumped into the swimming pool this summer. That has kind of a double meaning. Oh, mysterious. Next is blurt. It means to say something quickly. I blurted out the news as soon as I heard it. Like, I blurted out the secret. I couldn't hold it any longer. It means you just say something without thinking, to blurt. The first part of the word, blurt, that blurt sound, it sounds like something that just kind of is, sort of slips out on accident. And then the harsh t, blurt, the T at the end is like a kind of a final, like, oh my gosh, I've just said something. I've, I've slipped and then I've said something. Oh no, I didn't think about that. All right, that's the end of that one. So I hope you learned a few new onomatopoeias that you can try out next time. Thanks for joining us for Weekly Words, and I will see you again next time. Bye-bye. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Hi! <laughs> Sorry. Hey, and welcome back to Weekly Words. My name is Alicia, and this week we're going to talk about interjections. This is going to be fun. Let's start. The first word is bah, B-A-H. <laughs> Maybe you're upset about something or you're tired of dealing with something. People will often throw up their hands like this when they say it. They'll go bah and walk away. Bah humbug is a very, very well-known uh, use of this interjection. This is from uh, the story A Christmas Carol. One of the characters says bah humbug at all these things that upset him. All right, the next interjection is aha. Aha is used whenever you feel surprised about something or when you have a good idea about something. For example, sitting at work. <laughs> Actually, maybe you shouldn't do this at work because your coworkers will think you're crazy. If you're feeling really excited about your idea, you can go like this with your finger and go, aha, I have an idea for my presentation next week. Okay. <laughs> the next one is meh. This one I think has only become popular in the last 
I don't know, started being used, I think it started more on the internet and now it has come to be used in everyday life. Meh is just when you're, you're not very excited about something. Um, maybe you went to a party, your friend asks you how it was, and you're like, yeah, I went, it was pretty meh. We use it like an adjective, actually. Or you can just use it as a one-word interjection. Meh. 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 Okay. <laughs> Next word is O. Oh. O oh is a very, very useful one. You can use O oh in a number of situations. When you're surprised, when you're thinking of something, when you want to have kind of a soft introduction to whatever you're saying. I think I tend to use it uh, as a question or when I'm feeling surprised. So when my friend tells me something like, oh, hey, I have this great news, I'll say, oh? just by itself as a question to get somebody's attention. I might say, oh, did you see that new movie last week? A sentence starter for me anyway. Okay, the next word is hmm. We use hmm when we're thinking about something, when we need a minute to consider our thoughts. It can be used at the beginning of a sentence or just while you're thinking on its own. Hmm, what might be a good example sentence for hmm? End, end, those are all interjections. Those are all interjections. Try to use them. If you use these correctly in your speech, throughout your speech, uh, it'll help you to sound a lot more natural and a lot more smooth uh, in your speaking ability. So give them a try. Thanks again for joining us this week and I will see you next time for more Weekly Words. Bye. Begin. Hi everybody, welcome back to Weekly Words. My name is Alicia and this week we're going to look at some common English idioms. Let's begin. The first word, or phrase rather, is about to. About to means you're going to start something, you're going to begin doing something. For example, I'm about to start explaining this idiom to you. Hey hey. Okay, the next word, or phrase, idiom, the next idiom is by the way. The word here they've used is incidentally. It's a way to transition to another topic that's related to what you're talking about. For example, this week I'm going to a party. By the way, did you hear about the party happening next week? So they're somewhat related. Ooh. Okay. Uh, the next idiom is in a way. In a way. Hmm, this is kind of... In a way, it was a good thing that the burrito shop was closed because otherwise I would have eaten way too much. And you can use this to show that there are maybe two sides to a situation. Maybe some things are negative, maybe some things are positive. Next is, on the other hand, I hear this a lot, on the other hand is a way of uh, just saying however or to share two different sides to a story. For example, I think my coworker is really irritating. On the other hand, at parties, he's really funny. Mm. So you can show two maybe different sides to a point with this phrase. Next is a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, as an idiom. Uh, this is a long way to just say actually or really. It's a little bit more formal sounding, so you might use it in a business meeting, for example. Everybody at the business meeting might feel a little bit unsure about the previous month's sales. Uh, and you can begin your presentation by saying something like, I know everybody was a little bit unsure about last week's or last month's sales performance, but as a matter of fact, things improved. And that's the end. Those are some common idioms that you might hear in English. Give them a try. They're pretty useful and you might hear a lot of them uh, in conversation. Thanks very much for joining us this week and we'll see you again next time for more information. Bye. Hi, welcome back to Weekly Words. My name is Alicia and this week we're going to talk about ways to say hi. This should be fun. Let's get started. First is yo. <laughs> this one is a little bit casual in case you couldn't tell. Used for close friends, maybe family members if you have kind of a silly relationship with them. It's just quick, short, easy to do. In a sentence, yo, how's it going? Howdy. Howdy, uh, traditionally associated with cowboy culture, I suppose. You should play a banjo, maybe, or you've just gotten off a horse. I don't know. I use howdy from time to time. Howdy. 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 Dun 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 dun. That was my banjo. <laughs> yeah, in a sentence you might say, Howdy, folks. Welcome to the barbecue place. <laughs> Next is hey. Hey is a good, friendly phrase. You can usually use hey with a wave and smile, look happy. If you don't, people might think that you're down in the dumps. People might think you're not in a very good mood. In a sentence, hey, uh, I heard you got uh, engaged last week. Congratulations. Something like that. It's usually kind of a cheery, happy expression. All right, next is what's up. Uh, what's up is the long form of sup. This does not literally mean what is above you right now. If you want to be funny, you can say the ceiling or the sky, but that joke gets old really fast and chances are the person you're talking to has already heard it before. It just means what are you up to? What is going on with you? In a sentence, what's up? Did you have a good weekend? Typical response to what's up is not much. Find out some more responses in English in three minutes. We did an episode on this. Nothing much. How about you? That's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> I don't know.
know what I'm doing. Uh, the next one is long time no see. You can use this when you haven't seen the other person for a long time. You're at a party or an event or whatever. Anytime it's been a long break. You can decide how long long is. Not the day before or the week before. Maybe a few weeks or a month. Whatever is unusual for you and this other person. When you see them, you can say, hey, long time no see. How have you been? Uh, that's the end. So those are a few different ways to say hi in a few different situations. I hope that you have a chance to try them out the next time you meet someone or you greet someone. Thanks very much for joining us this week, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. <laughs> Instead of saying sup, I like to say soup. Sup. Soup. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to be talking about 10 different phrases that you can use to respond to the question, how are you? So let's go. I'm great. The first phrase is, I'm great. If someone says, how are you? You can say, I'm great. Try to say, I'm great with a kind of an, an upbeat voice. Um, so something like, how are you? I'm great. I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling bad. If you say, I'm feeling bad. The other person is probably, if they're a friend of yours or a coworker, going to ask you why, what happened. So if you want to use I'm feeling bad, make sure you have an explanation ready. Anyway, somebody says, how are you? And you go, I'm feeling bad. Maybe I went out for drinks last night with my coworkers. Oops. I'm okay. I'm okay. I feel like this is one of those intonation practice ones. I'm okay with that. Ah, I'm okay. It's like sort of upward intonation. You're like, Cool. But if, if someone says, how are you? And you're like, I'm okay. <laughs> They're like, oh no, what happened? So you can use your intonation with I'm okay to make it a good thing or a not so good thing. But either way, it's not like a very like, super serious response. Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine this would be in a more formal situation. Like if my friend said to me, how are you? And I was like, thank you for asking. They'd be like, what? I would say I'm fine or I'm doing well, I'm doing great, plus thank you for asking. So I have to say, how are you? Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Mm. Oh, that's how I would use it. And you? The next one is and you. Like the least natural response to how are you is I'm fine, thank you, and you. Like just get out of, put it, just take it out of your head. Nobody says that. I always say how about you. That's a much more natural thing. How are you? How are you? How are you can be a response, again, after you have given your answer to the question, how are you? I'm great. How are you? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? How have you been recently? How have you been recently? This is only useful if you haven't seen the other person for a while. I'm not bad. I'm not bad. I'm not bad. How are you? I'm not bad. No, I'm not bad. Hmm. Things could be worse. <laughs> I would probably do this. I'm sleepy. The next expression is I'm sleepy. Hey, it's like so specific. If someone said, how are you? I would probably say, I'm okay, but I'm a little sleepy. I don't know that I would just say I'm sleepy, unless it's a really good friend of mine. It's a person close to you. You can say, oh, I'm so tired. I'm, I would say I'm super tired or I'm really tired. Uh, and I feel like that's a little bit more natural than just, I'm sleepy. I'm good. One that I use a lot, if someone says, how are you? I say, I'm good. Uh, that's just probably my go-to response. Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Maybe I'll repeat it while smiling. I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, thanks for asking. Great, uh -huh. how are you? That is the end. Those are 10 phrases that you can use to respond to the question, how are you? If there's one takeaway from this and from other things that we've done over the last few years in this channel, just get rid of that I'm fine, thank you, and you, and pick one of these that we've talked about today. Um, of course, if there's another expression that you use for a response to how are you, I'd be very interested to learn about that. <laughs> but uh, in general, you're pretty safe if you stick with these, I think. So, thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words, and we will see you again soon. Bye. Noise. Vamos a la piscina. That means we're going to the movie theater, right? All right. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome back to Top Words. Today, we're going to be talking about must-know expressions for agreeing and disagreeing. Very useful. So let's go. Exactly. Exactly. When you agree 100% with something someone else has said, you can say exactly. For example, 
Ramen is one of the best foods in the world. Exactly. I don't agree. I don't agree. You have a different opinion from the other person. They tell you, I think that soccer is the best sport. You can say, eh, I don't agree. But be prepared to provide your own opinion after this. I think soccer is the best sport. I don't agree. I think that football is. Oh, that could cause some problems. <laughs> soccer, football. Americans say football when we mean American football. But the rest of the world says football when they mean soccer. Maybe. Maybe is when you don't know, when you can't make a decision or when you're not sure about something. Okay, so someone tosses you an opinion. Someone says their, their idea to you. I think it's gonna rain tomorrow. You can say, yeah, maybe. You don't know for sure, yes or no, but it's possible. It's a good sort of in-between expression. But if you use maybe all the time, it's gonna sound really strange and it's gonna sound like you can't make a decision. So use maybe very sparingly. Don't use it so often. Maybe is very commonly used as a soft no. It's up to you to figure that out among the people that you're talking to, though. Do you want to stay over at my house this weekend? Eh, maybe. I couldn't agree with you more. You are in complete agreement with the other person and really want to communicate that to them. You think that what they have just said is really, really correct, super correct. Yes, you are completely on board with that idea. You can say, I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't, the negative form. I could not agree with you more, meaning it's not possible that I could agree more with what you're saying. Next week, it's really important that we have a barbecue because summer is ending. And then your friend can say, I couldn't agree more. That's a fantastic idea. I'll buy steak. I think we're going to have to agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. This is a kind of, it seems like a simple phrase, agree to disagree. So you're agreeing with the other person. You agree that we have a different opinion. Agree to disagree. I would use this expression at the end of a discussion. So person A and person B have different opinions and they've been discussing those opinions for a long time. And person A is not changing his or her opinion. Person B is not changing his or her opinion. So you can say at the end of the conversation, okay, we have to agree to disagree. Let's just accept our different opinions and move on in the conversation. You have a point there. This is not necessarily a an agreement or disagreement phrase. It's a small agreement within a larger discussion. So maybe you've been discussing a topic for a long time and you've disagreed with the other person until this, this time. This person says something and you agree with that. Ah, you have a point there. So there's one thing that this person has said that you can agree with. You can say, you have a point there. I think that's correct or I agree with that Point. That's exactly how I feel. That's exactly how I feel. Uh, meaning, my feeling is the same as your feeling, or my opinion is the same as your opinion. That's exactly how I feel. Maybe you can use this if someone describes your feeling very accurately. For example, you can say, I feel like the company is really heading in a nice new direction. You can say, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. I really like the new boss. I don't think so. I don't think so. It's soft, it's not so direct, it's not a hard I disagree, but just I don't think so. Of course you can use it to discuss opinions, but you can also use it when you're making plans. Are you going to that party this weekend? Eh, I don't think so. It's not a disagreement, but it can be used as a negation phrase, and a negative um, response to something. When used as an opinion, uh, I think Chinese is the hardest language to learn. You can say I don't think so, I think that Arabic is the hardest language to learn. Yes you're right. Yes, you're right means you're correct. Yes, I agree with you. I think that's the right information. I think that's the correct opinion. Just a very clear agreement phrase. You're right. It also has the nuance of being correct. So maybe there was, there, there was a possibility the other person could be incorrect. Did you know that pepperoni pizza is the most delicious pizza in the world? Yes. You're right. So you can change it to that's right for that opinion. You can use your to talk specifically about the person itself, but that's right. Yes, that's right. That information is correct. I guess so. I guess so. It's so, it's an agreement, but it's sort of a flaky agreement. I guess so. It's like you don't really want to make a decision, uh, but 
you don't feel strongly in one, like in agreement or disagreement, you can say, I guess so. It's usually said with this tone of voice, I guess so. You know, we don't really say, I guess so. Generally, it's like you can't quite make a decision or you don't want to make a decision. You can say, I guess so. But hey, we're going to go for Chinese food for dinner tonight. Do you want to come? Yeah, I guess so. You don't feel strongly either way. Eh, I guess so. I'm afraid I disagree. It's a rather polite expression that you can use in a business situation, for example. I'm afraid here doesn't mean I'm actually scared or I'm really frightened, but just it's a softener that's used at the beginning of sentences to introduce a negative opinion. So I'm afraid I disagree or I'm afraid I can't agree with you, for example. I think that you need to adopt a new policy for your company. I'm afraid I disagree. It's a soft disagreement that sounds a bit more formal than some of the other phrases we've talked about so far. Absolutely, absolutely means 100%. Yes, exactly, precisely, definitely. It's a quick and clear and can be polite as well as casual um, word that means you agree with the other person. Hey, do you wanna go to the beach this weekend? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, oh, that's the end. Uh, so those are some phrases that you can use to agree and disagree with other people. There are a lot of them, so, and you can kind of mix and match them uh, as you see fit. Uh, so give them a try. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Fly is beach. <laughs>